I'm Marcy. I'm a volunteer with the Marin History Museum. And I want to welcome you to our Zoom presentation that is part of our ongoing lecture series. And, you know, I was just wondering, soon we're going to wonder what we ever did before Zoom. <laughs> I'm just glad in the meantime, we're able to still do these presentations and get together in this unusual way to share Marin history. I wanna mention that we're going to be collecting all the questions. So if you use that little chat button, wherever it is on your screen, on my phone is down on the bottom, on this desktop, it's up on the top. But if you click the chat, type me a question, I'll track them and then I'll, I'll present them to Fred at the end of the um, presentation. So I hope that's all good. Carol's telling us that we're recording. And yes, this will be recorded. So I guess she can see the questions too. That's great. Anyway, um, I want to mention that um, this is how we do give our support. Now support is a really big part of the Marin History Museum's um, programs. And we have big plans for our future as we come out of the changes that we've been under for the end of this year. Hopefully they'll change and we'll have um, events at a, a group setting. But our main um, support that we give our community includes youth education, community outreach, and events like this tonight. But support goes both ways and we need all of your support to keep going. And I invite you to check out our website at www.marinhistory.org and check out um, all our events, things that are new in our collection department, our e-news, our history stories, just about everything you can think of. With that, I wanna introduce our presenter tonight, Fred Renner. He is a trained historian that I met several years ago in my attempts to avoid everything trains. My <laughs> history was people and places and everything I tried to do, I bumped into a train. So I had to learn about trains. And I think that train that's in the picture behind Fred is just the cutest little train. Isn't, do you train people like to be here that uh, trains are cute? I think they're cute. My actually favorite train picture is the one on the Galena uh, Creek Bridge. But Fred's been doing this train history for over 20 years. His history involves Mount Tam, the Tamalpais, railways, and especially this number nine engine. Even forming the uh, friends of the number nine, trying to um, get the train back to Marin County, which they succeeded in doing, and now we're gonna preserve it. And that takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of support. There's that word again, everybody needs support. But it is our history and we wanna support it and keep talking, talking about it. So I'm gonna turn this over to Fred and uh, hopefully all the rest of the 50 people that plan to join us can uh, catch up. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Marcy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thanks for everybody for supporting these, these uh, Zoom get togethers in this COVID time. <clears throat> um, I'm the president of the Friends of Number Nine, which uh, if you're wondering what number nine is, that's number nine right there. Uh, and what number nine looked like in 1921. Um, 36, 34 feet long, uh, 12 feet wide and, uh, I'm sorry, nine feet wide and 12 feet high. Um, a mere 36 tons of steam engine. It was the last steam engine ever purchased for Mount Tamil Pius. Um, and amazingly, unlike everything else from the railroad of Mount Tamil Pius, uh, in that's railroad equipment. This is the only thing that's left. And, uh, we managed to win it in an auction. Uh, with a lot of community support, and uh, mm -hmm. now we're slowly um, restoring it. Um, we've done a bunch of good stuff. I'm going to talk about that um, in a few minutes. I thought I'd start by talking about how um, I got interested in the railroad, an overview of the railroad, um, a bit of number nine history, and then um, some of what the news of what we're doing for the restoration. So uh, with that, I'm going to click the screen share. Go to my fabulous slideshow, if I do say so myself. She keeps eating. <laughs> and where's my cursor? I can't find my cursor. There it is. No, it's not. Marilyn yeah. needs to mute. 
Why does this come up like this? Huh. So let's see if I can get this going again. No, nope, like that. So what I need to do first is this mm -hmm. and do that and then do this and then do that. <laughs> now I got it. There we go. So um, I've been interested in Mount Temple Pius' scenic railway for about 30 years now. Um, it's it absolutely fast. The cover of this 1917 brochure is a romantic summary of uh, what the railway experience was for those who were lucky enough to ride it. Um, as you can see, there's a, a train running along the edge of Richardson's Bay, which Richardson's Bay, as you all know, don't, doesn't look exactly like this. But this is, you know, again, a romantic look at that idea of riding along Richardson's Bay and then making the turn heading into Mill Valley. And then uh, you'll notice that the, there are the faint lines of the railroad grade drawn in here by an artist. And it shows the railroad grade climbing up here and zigzagging back and forth across this ridge and finally winding up here at the tavern. And that's sort of what it was like, um, but it's a nice representative of, of that whole experience. The best single uh, sentence summary of, of the railroad was written by a Tamil Pius historian, Lincoln Fairley. And he said, uh, it reminds us today of the great but simple pleasures that are now lost to us. And I couldn't agree more with that. Um. So uh, my first experience with the Mountain Railroad uh, was at the West, West Point Inn. Um, in the 1980s, some friends invited me to the West Point Inn. I'd never been there before. If you've ever been to the West Point Inn or if you've never been to the West Point Inn, you'll know it's a, you should know it's a rustic lodge high on the mountain. And like so many people, my first trip uh, to get there was by walking. <clears throat> I had never been. And when you get there, the inn seems like a, an outpost in the middle of nowhere. And it has gas lights, which seemed amazing to me in the 20th century when I was there. Um, what is this place? Somebody told me that it had been built by a railroad. Really? Um, the view from the end, of course, is incredible. That's Muir Woods down below in the shadows and in San Francisco looking sort of like the Emerald City off in the distance. There are no paved roads to the West Point Inn. As it turns out, the dirt road that surrounds the inn was in fact built for steam trains. You can see a little piece of rail that is historically not part of the inn, but it lends a nice piece of atmospheric uh, uh, enhancement around the, uh, the outside of the inn. Um, anyway, it was stunning to me to learn that, the, uh, that steam trains ran on this gravel road that you see on the right. You could see that there were great stories here and all of them started a long time ago. In 1896, a small group of Marin businessmen did a very bold thing. They built a scenic railway up Mount Tamalpais. In 1896, San Francisco was the biggest city west of St. Louis. What we think of as the West was everything from the Mississippi River to the Golden Gate. San Francisco was the jewel of the West. But in between San Francisco and St. Louis was pretty much nothing. Where would the customers come from for this bold venture? That was a pretty crazy idea. Anyway, in 1896, the Mill Valley Mount Tamalpais Railway created a scenic and engineering marvel. It cost $55,000 to build. Um, it cost $80,000 in equipment. The total cost of it was $135,000, which roughly translates to about $4 million today. It took six months to build the railroad. Um, work crews uh, using picks, shovels, and blasting powder an average of 200 laborers gouged, chipped, and blasted uh, the railroad grade eight and a fifth miles out of the so uh, up, mount up the mountain out of the solid rock of Mount Tamalpais. There were 22 trestles that spanned the creeks and canyons along the way. When they got to the summit, they built the Tavern of Tamalpais. And when they were done in November of 1896, they lit a bonfire that proclaimed that they were open. And San Francisco saw the bonfire blazing in the night sky. The Tavern of Tamil Pius had a lobby and a small uh, restaurant that served local meat produce, per, and produce. Beer and wine were both local and international. Um, the wines came from France and they also came from the Napa Valley. Guinness Stout was on the menu. It came from Ireland. Upstairs, there were eight guest bedrooms. 
wouldn't you want to stay here? I would. <laughs> the railroad quickly became a became more popular than the uh, managers had ever imagined. In 1897, a year after opening, tourists overwhelmed the tavern and its restaurant when train loads of over 200 passengers arrived. Also in 1897, a phone line was run from Mill Valley up to the summit. It was high tech and it was posh in 1897. A weather station was built also and the US Weather Service began collecting data to forecast weather. This, there was now science at the top of the mountain. In March of 1898, Thomas Edison's film crew shot movies on the railroad, likely the first movie shot in Marin. The small railroad threw all of its resources into the effort. It was a brilliant move that would show people on the East Coast moving pictures of this new scenic railway in California. In July of 1898, the scenic railroad was a cover story on Scientific American. A magazine praised the railroad as an engineering marvel and gave examples. For most people, the trip up Mount Tamalpais um, started in San Francisco at the ferry building over here. Um, a white steam powered ferry boat carried passengers across the bay, past Alcatraz to Sausalito. Then a narrow gauge steam train carried them from Mill Valley, uh, carried them from Sausalito into Mill Valley. Later on, it was an electric streetcar. Um, a quick change of trains in Mill Valley and then on up the mountain um, to the summit. The whole trip took under just two hours. In 1896, Marin looked like this. Pastoral vistas were everywhere. This is Southern Marin County, the view from the Sausalito Hills to Mount Tamalpais. Railroad tracks to Mill Valley are along the right side of, of the frame. Later on, of course, that's where Marin Ship will be built. But that's another story. The tracks to Mill Valley ran across wetlands. Today, this is Miller Avenue. Tam High School's Safeway would be on the right side of the tracks here. The Scenic Railway's first depot uh, was on the dirt streets of downtown Mill Valley. The building is still there. It's a storefront on Throckmorton Avenue. Today, it's called The Store. This is where you'd buy tickets, climb aboard the mountain train, then two toots of the whistle and the adventure would begin. The train climbs eight miles up the twisting track on a steep mountainside. The view keeps changing. Passengers would stand as the city of San Francisco first came into view. There were 281 curves between Mill Valley and the summit, enough turns to equal 42 complete circles, an average of five per mile. So the railroad began calling itself the crookedest railroad in the world. At the summit was the Tavern of Tamil Pius. The popular destination was expanded quickly, adding a dance pavilion on the left and the archway over the tracks. This is the original uh, 1896 tavern and it's uh, in 1898, they add this archway over the tracks here. And this is the dance pavilion that was built in 1897, but it gets better. In 1900, business was so good, they expanded the tavern again. This is the new tavern um, expanded by 30 some rooms. The restaurant's also been expanded. This whole section here is added to the, to the um, tavern to enlarge the restaurant. And of course they've added a whole bunch of rooms upstairs, suites and, and individual rooms. Um, the archway is still there and so is the dance pavilion. On the other side of the archway, and for your reference, here's the archway, um, dance pavilion here, here's the tavern over here, here's the weather station where our friends at the US Weather Service uh, worked. You can see two uh, painters working on a uh, little maintenance on the, um, on the building and certainly it is not an OSHA scaffolding that they're uh, working on there. Um, just a bit of a footnote here, uh, this railroad card here is actually uh, water tanks. This is how the tavern got its water. There has never been any good source of water up at the peak, so the railroad had to bring water several times a week up to the tavern. Uh, they used uh, this tank, this flat car with the tanks on it. They actually had an outlet here between the tracks. There was a hose that connected to the water tanks and the steam engines provided the uh, steam to pump, to work the pump that would pump water from here up to the water tanks on the hillside that would then use gravity to take to supply water to the tavern. The railroad of course had uh, inns too. The West Point Inn was uh, one that was built in 1904. It was a place where the steam trains met a horse drawn stagecoach for the beach. The inn is a vestige of the wild west with a history that includes an attempted stagecoach holdup by a masked gunman. Uh, the West Point Inn still stands today. It's listed on the National Register of Historic Places thanks to Dewey Livingston. Um, 
the in non-COVID times, you can spend the night here. And in fact, the inn's working to find ways to reopen itself and uh, meet all the applicable laws for little inns in Marin County. There was also the Muir Woods Inn. I love this shot. Um, a rustic inn that welcomed the first tourists to Muir Woods. This was the main building with a lobby, a bar, and a restaurant inside. We know John Muir himself dined here at least once. Guests spent the night in nearby rustic cabins, which in fact are very similar to the cabins that exist today at West Point Inn. Sadly, the building didn't last for more, didn't last for five years before it burned to the ground. And one of the better stories is that within five and a half weeks after this building burned down, the road had pushed the tracks deeper into the canyon and, and, and was open for business and advertising in San Francisco newspapers. Uh, and of course, they had cabins for overnight stays. Five and a half weeks from the time this burned down to the time that they were back in service again. And in the middle of all that, there was the 1913 fire on Mount Tamalpais that burned the whole southern face of the mountain. That's a pretty uh, industrious railroad, I think. Anyway, railroad employees were the first guides of Muir Woods. Fred Whitmore, the man on the right with the megaphone, um, was a, a guide for tourists and a few celebrities. In June of 1923, Whitmore was a guide for Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, a man smart enough and clever enough to invent Sherlock Holmes. Conan Doyle came with his family and uh, later wrote a short memoir about their trip. He said, in all our wanderings, we've never had a more glorious experience. He praised the railroad as a good and reverent steward of its lands. He said that uh, they had made the, the wilderness accessible and yet tenderly guarded it from all vulgarity. One is not allowed to pick so much as a flower in the redwood grove, and one feels that all of this should be national parkland, he said. Mount Tamalpais was also famous for its gravity cars, four-wheeled coasters with brakemen that coasted down the mountain at 12 miles an hour, about as fast as a mountain biker does today. Gravity cars were invented in 1902. They were a fun money-saving way for the railroad to bring overnight guests down the mountain. Initially, they departed the tavern at sunrise, leaving uh, heading down to Mill Valley um, to meet the morning con commute trains as the sun rose, rose above the East Bay Hills. The company liked the joke that gravity cars were powered by gravity. Gravity cars were towed back to the summit for the next scheduled run. You can see two gravity cars in the right on the right foreground here. By the way, this is how the trains ran on Mount Tamalpais. The locomotive backed up the mountain, pushing the passenger cars ahead of it up the mountain. This was uh, primarily a safety feature. That way, no one ever had to worry about the couplings breaking or a car careening down the mountain. It also kept the smoke out of their faces. The engines led uh, the way back down the mountain. Sometimes gravity cars carried passengers, but that was against the rules. The small railroad was smart about promotion too. They hired the best photographers of the day to take beautiful, inspiring shots of the railway's features. Famed frontier photographer, William Henry Jackson was one of them. Jackson was the Ansel Adams of the frontier. This is one of his shots. He and his crew hauled around a huge camera and shot spectacular photos on two foot by two foot glass negatives. Another photographer was E.A. Cohen. These photos appeared in brochures and also on postcards. Here's another photo that I like. No idea who took it, but uh, it's an eyeful. Another wonderful event that was the railroad helped with was the mountain play. This shows the mountain theater in the early 30s, but in the teens and, and 20s, the mountain railroad played an important part in bringing uh, guests to the play. In those days, the, the entire mountain theater was a, mountain, was a hillside meadow. The trains carried loads of people up the mountain and they stopped at West Point. Uh, it was the biggest day of the year for West Point when, those, when that happened. Um, you can see the trains parked on the old stage road. In 1920, they built a siding down the stage road. At West Point Inn, it was so busy, they had to hire extra help. And uh, as the playgoers got off the trains, the innkeepers would take orders for fresh chicken dinners because there were chickens running around West Point in those days. So that's how fresh your dinners were. Um, when they finished the play, they'd come back, and if you had a reservation, you'd have a seat either on the porch or you can see the new dining room here, um, over here on the right. Uh, that was built in 1920, the same year that the, uh, um, that the siding was built. You can also see fire damage from a fire that uh, burned here in 1916 that threatened the end, but uh, luckily never, uh, never 
caught the they had never caught on fire. Here's two of the actors that were in the 1918 play of Robin Hood. This is Maid Marian, um, and uh, uh, Fallen Leaf is the is the name of the elf. It's, and you can see how how wonderful the detail was. This is obviously long before sound systems and other things, where everybody had to have a good set of lungs and project so that people at the top of the grassy meadow could hear what was going on. So as you can see, there was an awful lot going on at Mount Tamalpais. The railroad offered food and drink and hospitality with city style against a rustic backdrop. As most everybody knows, its primary business was tourism, showing people a breathtaking view from the mountaintop or a chance to go around primeval forest called Muir Woods. But there was also an interesting subtext of environmentalism. They promoted wilderness preservation and made Marin wilderness easy to appreciate and rejuvenating when they compared it with the noisy and frequently smelly cities that, they, that the visitors knew. Sadly, in 1930, the railroad was brutally scrapped. The rails were ripped from the ground. The passenger cars were burned in uh, Mill Valley Creek and presumably the gravity cars were too. The locomotives were sold for scrap. The railroad was swept away and thrown on a trash heap called Progress. Today, very little remains. The West Point Inn's still there. It's 116 years old now. It and its six cabins um, are places where you can spend the night when, it's, when COVID isn't uh, in full swing. One of the cabins, interestingly, was built by a man who survived the Titanic in Lifeboat 13. That's always a great conversation starter. <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, when you go, you can uh, spend the evening reading a book under gaslights, or uh, you can enjoy a dinner that you've prepared yourself in the kitchen while you watch the sunset on San Francisco. There's also a beautifully restored model of a Tamil Pius steam engine on display at the Marin History, at the Marin Museum of Bicycling. It's just been moved there. It actually was supposed to go uh, on display back in spring, but COVID stopped that. So the Marin Museum of Bicycling has just reopened. And uh, they're open Thursdays through Saturday from 11 to five. Again, the community support thing is in play here. This model was built in 1911 by Howard Folker. Um, this was actually how he learned to become a machinist. He started working on the railroad as a brakeman in 1918 and was one of the most smart and ambitious men to work on the railroad. Um, he, uh, his family says he was the youngest engineer ever on the mountain railroad. And to become a machinist, uh, he was instructed to build this one-tenth scale model, all of it from scratch, except for the screws and, and, uh, and small bolts and nuts. Everything else he had to create molds for and machine the metal at one-tenth scale. He had real engines outside that he could go measure and, and then create his molds and copies. Um, Phil Gazzano, uh, a master modeler, restored the model cleaning away the dust and dirt that had collected on it over years and, uh, and the missing parts that were gone too. The company that had scrapped the Mountain Railroad has loaned it to uh, us here in Marin. Um, Phil said that to create this model would have taken three years of, of time to, to make all the parts and put it all together. There's one other surviving piece and it's one I love to talk about, engine number nine. This is it, uh, the last uh, locomotive purchased by the Mountain Railroad, 36 tons of steam engine history. It's 99 years old. Number nine was the last engine built for the Mountain Railroad. It's a powerful and handsome engine with gold leaf lettering on the cab and tender. Dark red drop shadow uh, underlines every gold letter. Number nine ran on Mount Tamalpais for three years. In 1924, it was sold for $9,750. That sale saved the railway from showing a loss that year. Number nine was sold to a logging company called the Siskiyou Lumber Company, and then later to the Dolbeer and Carson Lumber Company near Eureka. In 1953, when steam engines were being replaced by trucks, the Pacific Lumber Company bought number nine as it was on its way to be scrapped. A few years later, it was put on display outside of uh, Pacific Lumber's new museum in Scotia, California. The museum could use the, the story of number nine to tell um, a rich tale about rugged steam powered forest logging, and also the story about being the very last steam engine of Mount Tamalpais. For the next 62 years, people tried to find a way to bring number, number nine back to Mount Tamalpais. Luckily, Pacific Lumber took very good care of number nine, preparing it for decades, standing outside in the damp Humboldt weather and adding a new coat of paint every few years. In March, 2018, 
After 62 years on display, the town was no, no longer one of the locomotive and number nine was put up for auction. In fact, all the equipment seen here inside that chain link fence was put up for auction. So when we, when we won the auction of number nine, we won all the other goodies here too. We had to figure out who should get them and, and how they would uh, be disposed. And uh, the bulk of them went to the Timber Heritage uh, Association in, in near Eureka who um, collects and restores um, not only steam engines, but uh, logging equipment. When we bid, there were, uh, there were six bidders. Friends of number nine bid the highest, but just barely. We bid $56,240, which was only 6% more than the runner up. Winning involved removing all of this equipment from the park, a process that involved cranes and trucks and patients, and of course money. On November 27th, 2018, almost 98 years after the order for number nine first landed on a desk in, in Erie, Pennsylvania, number nine left Scotia and began a 200 mile trip back to Marin. The next morning we unloaded number nine, lifting uh, the 36 ton locomotive from a trailer and placing it on two rails in Sonoma County. Moving, of course, was a big deal. So what's the, uh, what's the future of number nine? First, we have to assess the locomotive and consider the scope of restoration. It's a process that's full of detail and the Friends of Number Nine has come a long way creating lists of everything on the locomotive. What's there, what's missing, what's needed to restore the, the locomotive, the 1921 locomotive. It's our goal to restore Number Nine to how it looked in 1921 when it first came to Mount Tamil Pius. Surprising, a surprising amount of the locomotive is intact. Pacific Lumber did a good job for us um, and uh, after 62 years, uh, there were unfortunately parts missing, or in this case, damaged. <clears throat> this is inside the cab. You're looking at uh, the steam pressure gauge and the air pressure gauges that would have told the engineer how good the uh, air pressure was in the brake systems. There's also rusted metal that needs to be replaced. We've mapped out things to fix and replace uh, on the locomotive. Uh, through uh, the original, using the original 1920 order and uh, the historic photos we have. This illustration by Joe Breeze um, took him hundreds of hours to create. Uh, the drawing is a computer blueprint of number nine. It's been tremendously helpful for us. You can see that we've um, uh, added to Joe's drawing the places that need uh, metal replaced. So for example, this panel here uh, needs to be cut out and a little bit of metal goes there, more metal here. The fire pan is in terrible shape, so that has to be uh, largely rebuilt. There's a fair amount of corrosion down here along the bottom of the cab, and those sections need to be replaced as well. Joe also spent um, time um, researching and then working on uh, designing the missing fuel tank from 1921. So when we looked at, at creating that tank, uh, we found that there were very few that were ever created. Most Heisler engines used wood or coal for fuel and not oil the way number nine did. Joe spent over a hundred hours studying, researching, measuring, and then drawing this 650 gallon fuel tank so that we could get bids to create a new one. Joe's research uh, and drawings also helped us see what, uh, what a restored number nine would look like. He's only halfway through with this one, but this shows the interior of the cab um, and what those gauges will look like or begins to show what those gauges will look like when they're restored, as well as the other pieces around it. One of the other issues that we've had has been asbestos, a common thing on steam engines back in the day, but a real liability today. We hired Central Valley Environmental, a professional hazmat contractor to contain and remove the asbestos. So they built an airtight containment structure around number nine, complete with zippers. Patriotic zippers, no less. Uh, then they removed the asbestos and then took it to a hazmat landfill. Uh, we got a price break. It only cost us 12,000 bucks. As we were getting ready to move, remove the asbestos, we um, had to go do some work on the fire pan underneath the locomotive. That's this area down here. Um, uh, uh, in the, in, I'm told in that area, the uh, a huge, is, that's where the huge fire burned to turn uh, cold water into steam. Uh, the fire burned at about 1800 degrees raging there. Um, 
as, uh, to keep the, you know, the, the boiler um, at full pressure. Inside the fire pan was some asbestos. We also found that it was a time capsule. We found a collection of old Shasta soda cans. Here's one. Um, there were no beer cans, which was a little surprising. There was also um, pieces of charred wood. And in fact, um, this piece here is this piece. Um, our steam engine expert, David Waterman, recognized that, the, that these were pieces of a window. And we took the parts uh, up to number nine's cab. The parts fit only in one window, and that was the engineer's window. That's the parts we fished out that you're seeing a big piece of the parts that we fished out of the fire pan. This is not like a regular window in houses. Um, what's interesting about this is that the hinges aren't along this side of the window. There are pins down here and also up on the top. And there's steel in the corner here that has a hole in the bottom the pin goes into. Um, amazingly, all this stuff is still intact after 99 years. Here's a photo from 1961 taken by Ted Worm. It shows the same damaged window frame uh, missing its left side. You know, the part that's missing actually uh, today. This is the same steel reinforcement plate. Here's another one up here. And that's where it sat um, in front of the engineer. We think somebody um, uh, took the, uh, the, the, in, the window out, broke the pieces, and, uh, and then lit them on fire, tossing them in the fire pan to see a fire flickering in there. Luckily, they all, none of them really burned up. What we've, one of the things that we discovered, though, that was really interesting was um, beneath the charred black paint is some red paint. This is original Mount Tamalpais red paint. Um, it's the only known sample of that paint. Um, there's a, when we, in, in the myriad of things that we've collected over, over time, um, one of the things that we got, thanks to Joe Breeze again, was a copy of the original order from 1920 um, of, for the locomotive, um, the order from uh, the Whitney Engineering Company, who was the sales agent for Heisler Locomotives. And there's this, the cover letter that came with that photocopy mentions that, that the, um, uh, the master mechanic at Dolbeer and Carson was embarrassed by the red color of the locomotive and wanted to get um, black paint from Heisler so he could cover up the red paint because it looked like, in his words, a circus wagon. And apparently his spelling wasn't very good. I think he spelled circus C-I-R-K-U-Z. And uh, the story that we had in the cover letter was that the Heisler company found the letter so poorly typed and so funny to read that they sent him the paint for free. So you're looking at the charred black paint that he put on top of the locomotive and the red paint that was underneath that he didn't like. Interestingly, that paint matches up very nicely with a historic painting that uh, a railroad employee named Roy Graves, a uh, renowned railroad historian for San Francisco, and at one time an employee on Mount Tamalpais, um, he consulted on this historic painting uh, that in fact uh, wants to show his brother Cliff. Um, so down here, that's, uh, that represents his brother Cliff. This in fact is uh, Howard Folker Sr., the man who made that 1911 steam engine model. Um, and um, Roy worked with a guy named Harlan Heine. His name's down here. I happened to speak to Heine's wife um, who mentioned that uh, this photo still hangs in his studio, uh, that Roy Graves had come down in 1965 to help with the color choices and the placement of the colors. And that this is as accurate as anyone could do in 1965. And the amazing part of course, is that it, it's so close to this color red, um, we're probably never gonna get more accurate than that. So here's the photograph that that painting is based from, or based on. This is uh, Cliff Graves here, Howard Folker. That's Frank Miller and um, Joe Pagnini is, your, is the fireman. Here's all the passengers waiting for the next trip down the mountain. One of the other mm -hmm. things that's happened to us that's been interesting is uh, we've been hearing from descendants of Tam Railway employees. This is Russ and John Davis, two brothers who through Ancestry.com learned that they were descendants of the first engineer on Mount Tam, a man named Ernest Thomas. Thomas was the first engineer on, on Mount Tamalpais and also its master mechanic. 
Sadly, Thomas was killed in the first railroad accident on Mount Tam in 1900. Luckily, in 34 years, there were only two accidents. John Davis wants to contribute to the restoration of number nine and will contribute to the restoring the engine de engineer details for number nine. Um, a nice tie in with, uh, with his ancestor. The restoration is underway. Soon we'll begin working on the corroded metal sections of the tender and then restoring the cab. That's what's up with engine number nine. And as you know, number nine is the only surviving piece of the Mount Tamil Pius Railway. It's a substantial example of American ingenuity. It's in fact a very early example of all wheel drive, of an all wheel drive mountain climbing vehicle. Our restoration work can only succeed with community support. Of course, we pre appreciate the tremendous amount of support we've seen already. Um, our goal is to make the locomotive look like this. This is how no number nine looked in 1921, as mentioned before. Um, with gold lettering on the tender, you can maybe on your computer, you can see the subtle differences with the, uh, the red drop shadow under the letters here, uh, the nine here, as well as up on the sand dome um, and the white wall tires. Interestingly, um, when we got number nine, we couldn't help but notice that uh, the tires on the engine, and yes, every steam engine has tires, uh, they actually slip over the, the wheels of the, on the trucks, but our tires have no wear on them. So not sure what we'll do about that. We'll have to find a way to put some wear on them. But uh, anyway, we think that number nine is uh, the last piece of a really great story. Thanks to all the people that helped uh, me put this together. And of course, I got to get a plug in for friends of number nine. And, uh, and a book that I wrote back in uh, 2009 with the help of a bunch of people uh, that is, uh, this was designed in ten, uh, uh, to help people that wanted to hike the railroad grade. Uh, it it um, starts in Mill Valley and goes to the summit and includes Muir Woods too. So you could go for a hike and take that with you and see what the railroad looked like back in the day. So uh, that's my story. Thanks very much. So might there be any questions? Because I got a ton of stories if you don't have questions. Well, I don't see any questions yet. Fred, tell us a story. Tell you a story? Yeah, I'll start with a story. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll pipe in if I get any questions here. Sure. One of my, um, one of my favorite stories, uh, Bill Provines, I, I'm going to jump in all around here. Um, I happened to be lucky enough to come along and be interested in this when there were still a few people around that had been involved with the railroad and with West Point Inn. Bill Provines was one of them. He was the last living crewman who worked on the Mountain Railroad. And uh, he lived to be 101 years old. Um, and he had the most brilliantly intact memory of anybody I've ever met in my life. Um, he could talk about 80 years ago like it was last week. Uh, it was incredible. Um, and he always had great stories. And, and the funny part for me on some level was that he always told them with exactly the same words, but the gold, the golden part of that was that, you know, every story got told the same way every time, but that meant you knew that he wasn't making the stories up, that they were, they were as accurate as he could make them. And so that was terrific. Um, anyway, um, Sunday mornings um, uh, was a special morning for the Mountain Railroad because they had an early train that went out at 940 and Bill was on that train. They usually used engine number four. Um, Charlie Stalker was the engineer and Charlie Stalker was an old friend of Bill's family and in fact had gotten Bill the job on the Mountain Railroad. Anyway, Bill went down about seven o'clock on Sunday morning and he'd uh, light the fire in the firebox and, and clean the windows and polish the brass. And, and then uh, Charlie would show up early that day. And uh, then Bill, because he was a devout Catholic would head on over to Mount Carmel and uh, get, be there in time for the Catholic service at eight o'clock. Uh, service ran from eight to 9.30. And at 9.30, he would bolt out of Mount Carmel and head to the train station. While he'd been in there, Charlie and the rest of the crew for their train had built the train uh, with passenger cars that were needed and then headed down to the depot. And when Bill got there at 9.30, they were 10 minutes away from leaving the station. Um, to me, that's a, ter a terrific piece of, of Americana. He only told me that story once, but it just, it, it just it sounded like, you know, it's a wonderful life to me. So it's one of my favorite stories. Um, so that's one of them. I got a couple uh, questions. Yeah. Let's see. So you're saying that the number nine will not be the red and silver colors like the photo you did of the number four? 
Correct. That, that was an interesting. The thing about number nine is that it, it arrived with its own um, paint job, really. Um, the lettering on number nine is unique um, among all the engines. None of them had lettering like what was on number nine when, when number nine arrived. Um, the, uh, the factory order that we have shows that they initially ordered uh, imitation gold leaf. And then at some point during the process, somebody put a line through imitation. So they actually had real gold leaf lettering on the tender. Um, and the lettering has a drop shadow on it. Now Tamil Pius had, a, had some history of using red drop shadow on its lettering. So um, you have to imagine that uh, if you look at the tender, you'll see that there's great contrast between the gold lettering and the red drop shadow. Um, and if there was a red tender, there wouldn't be that kind of contrast there. So um, it appears that um, the tender is black. The order says that the cab should be um, red. It says the tender should be red. It says the door to the cab should be black. But if you look closely at that photograph, you'll see that there's really no tonal shift at all across those surfaces, that they're all the same color. They're all the same shade. Um, so right now, and we will do some more investigating in this, but right now, um, the color, the coloring of number nine appears that the cab, the tender, and the door were all black. There seems like there were some areas that were uh, that had that maroon, but um, I, I, when the locomotive showed up with gold leaf lettering and a red drop shadow under the lettering on a black background, that sign had to pop. And you can see, you know, looking over my shoulder, you can see how well the letters stand out against the background there. So that's why I believe that it was different than the, than the uh, locomotive that we already saw. The other part is that in 1922, number nine gets a paint job. It loses all that wonderful lettering and gets a more generic Mount Tamil Pius lettering. So uh, when it got relettered, obviously it got a new paint job. Uh, they weren't gonna just put that other lettering over the old gold leaf. So at that point, I think the engine became the Tamil Pius red uh, with an ivory or perhaps white lettering on top of it. But when it arrives, it's a very unique engine. How about, um, where do you plan to display this once it's restored? Well, that's an interesting story. Um, and one we don't have an answer for yet. Um, we'd like to put it, um, we've decided as friends of number nine that we have three goals. We'd like to put it on or near the path of the railroad so that it has historic resonance. So in other words, if it was at the San Rafael Civic Center, it wouldn't have the meaning that it would have if it were in downtown Mill Valley or for that matter up on top of the mountain. So by putting it where it worked, it has more meaning. Um, so that's one of our goals. The other one is easy public access. So putting it at West Point Inn would probably make it hard to get to. Um, so again, the town of Mill Valley seems like a likely candidate or the East Peak. Um, and then um, we wanna protect it from uh, the elements and protect it from vandalism because we don't wanna put you know, the jewelry, as it were, the, the gauges and things back on it just to have it all stolen and disappear again. So, um, so we want to put it in a place where it has meaning. And uh, right, we've been talking with the city of Mill Valley. It's only a cursory discussion so far. We've also been talking to the California State Parks who is a little further along. They're actually discussing how they want to re, um, they want to change East Peak and make it a bit more visitor friendly. Um, and they have told us that they have a placeholder for engine number nine there. Um, so that's a, a step in the right direction. Um, and so that's a, um, that means that number nine could go up at East Peak where the Gravity Car Barn Museum is already, and perhaps be a, an addition to the, the Gravity Car Barn Museum, or it could go down in Mill Valley in the plaza there by the depot where it would have meaning there as well. Um, all these things have, there's a lot of discussion before we have an answer for that one. Can you, can you say how much more money you need to um, achieve the restoration and create the display? Um, we ballparked the restoration at somewhere around a quarter of a million dollars. Um, right now, we're, we're just scratching the surface. The asbestos was $12,000. Um, and securing the locomotive was uh, you know $56,000. But uh, so we think that the, the restoration is still going to be somewhere in the ballpark of about a quarter million. Um, and we're, we're $12,000 into that quarter of a million at this point. 
we estimate the um, the restoration of the tender um, somewhere between twenty five and thirty thousand dollars. The uh, the cab is probably somewhere around twenty five thousand um, dollars, and there's plenty of plumbing and other things that need to be uh, restored. We have gauges to to buy and other hardware to buy, and uh, the frame itself has some pretty bad rust in places. So we're going to have to lift the cab and the and the tender off to for the metal repairs, but then also work on the I beams that are the main frame of the locomotive. So. Um, those are all ballpark numbers, and that's as close as we are at this point. I thought it was um, fascinating the story of it being delivered down on the on the uh, truck that came in the big boom to lift it off the truck. And I got invited to come and see that process, and uh, was told if I could get there within a certain number of minutes, I'd be able. To <laughs> you know, you couldn't you couldn't predict what time it was going to arrive, and then. Right. Um, so I didn't get to be there right then. And I was asking Jeff and Roger, go, well, what did I miss? How was it? He goes, Jeff said, I don't know. He blinked and he missed it. He said, it took <laughs> 10 minutes. I go, oh my God, you guys are, what a job you do. Yeah, the, about, unloading, um, the unloading was the easy part. The loading <laughs> it up was, was, was a torturous process. Somebody's asking, um, what closed the, what, uh, what caused the closing of the Tamalpais Railroad system? Um, well, the uh, several things. Um, the one of them was, bill? yeah, that was a big part of it. The um, people were were becoming less interested in train rides in the 1920s. People were starting to own automobiles, um, yeah. and by 1925, um, Bridgecrest Boulevard was a gravel road uh, that opened up between uh, Bolinas Fairfax Road and the East Peak and the Tavern of Tamil Pius that the railroad was had been servicing since 1896. So. Um, when uh, when automobiles could get there and people could take buses, buses were exciting because they were new and novel and you could go anywhere in a bus and, the, and you couldn't go anywhere in a, in a train because it could only go where the tracks were. So people were more interested in doing that kind of a trip than they were in riding trains. And in fact, the other thing that conspired against the railroad was that it was worn out. Um, ridership dwindled in the 20s. Um, Bill Provines talked about when he was um, hired on the railroad in 1926 that, that Sunday, which was the busy day, they needed three trains to manage all the people that had to be moved around the mountain from Mill Valley up to the summit and then down into Muir Woods. And they had trains that moved people back and forth out of Muir Woods to Mesa Station where they could grab gravity cars to Mill Valley, things like that. And by the time he uh, left the mountain railroad in the summer of 1929, they only needed one train to handle everything on that busy Sunday. So there just wasn't the interest there anymore. And he said that he was certain that he heard Bill Thomas, who was the superintendent and um, master mechanic, that it would have required a quarter of a million dollars to rebuild the railroad. Um, they had nothing to mortgage to raise that kind of money. And, and the passenger load was so small at that point, there was no way for them to justify getting the money to, to rebuild things, to restore it. So the automobile and the worn out railroad was why the railroad went, went away. How I got one person asking how possible or impossible would it be to show that beautiful color picture of the number four again? Um, I think that's probably very possible. Let's see. I'm working. There you go. So that's out of the Bancroft Library. That's part of Roy Graves' photo collection over at the Bancroft Library. Roy took a picture of it, um, you know, uh, before he passed away in the 60s. But that was his work with uh, Harlan Heine. So is that a silver color or is that just the sun on the black? It's, um, it's a color called Russian blue, as I understand it. Oh, um, wow. That's the color that's on the, on the, uh, the boiler jacket. Um, so, and uh, Bill Provines had a story for, about how the, the color was created on the smokestacks. Uh, you'll notice it's a subtly different shade of gray. Uh, he said that what they took was a bucket of graphite and oil and mixed it up with their hands and then smeared that mixture of oil and graphite on the outside of the, of the smokestack when it was cold. And then when it was hot, the uh, oil got baked off and what was left was this um, sort of iridescent uh, film of graphite on the smokestack. Wow. So that was kind of an interesting story. 
Bill also told how they used Bonami cleanser to clean the windows, which was surprised me. I said, why did you use cleanser? And he said, because they hadn't invented Windex yet. Yeah. <laughs> so. Wow, yeah. so that's an actual photograph. Well, that this is actually, this is a painting. That's a photograph. That's the photograph right there, April 21st, 1907. And which is the painting? The That's color the painting. painting. Color. Oh, okay. And the, the painting is not is not an overlay of the photograph. You'll see that things are in different places. Um, the, mm. There's a water tank over on, on the uh, on the right here that doesn't show up at all in the photograph. Actually, that's not true. It's behind the smokestack. That's it right there. Um, so Harlan Heine is a, is a renowned railroad um, artist. He was fastidious about his color research work with, and would have done that with Roy. And I'm sure they would have spent hours working on it. It's beautiful. So this, and yes, and this photograph is too. This comes from the Folker family actually, uh, who still have this photograph. Um, the detail in it's extraordinary. Um, I was able to make a scan off it. This is an, a contact print that's off the, you know, was made as a contact print from the original negative. The, the detail in here is extraordinary. Wow. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can. So uh, will both of those be on display up at the, um, the barn on the top of the mountain? Um, how do you mean? You mean the photograph and the painting? Yeah. They are currently, uh, oh. or have been. Um, there was some discussion about uh, removing them um, and putting them in a different display, but uh, they are, the last time I was there, they were on display. Okay. I need to get up there. <laughs> yeah. Um, unfortunately, it's been, it, yeah, exactly. Thank you. It's, uh, it's uh, been closed, I think, since March um, with no idea of when it'll be reopening. Bummer. So, yes, exactly. But you can still go up there and walk all the way around Mount Dan. Yep. Yeah. yeah you can, as long as you stay outside, it's, minutes. <laughs> it's the being inside of things that's the problem. Yeah. Well, that was our last question. I okay. want to thank you, Fred, very much. And remind everyone to go to our website, sign up to get our emails and e-news so you know when the next upcoming talks are. Now, right now, we have scheduled on December 2nd. Um, Brian Crawford is going to do a talk on a, a really great project that the uh, collection uh, department with Heather and Lane in the museum put together and uh, made a book out of a, a diary that was done by the Bernal family when they came westward ho and settled here in Marin. And it's all about their artifacts that the museum has, the uh, story of how they got here and just what a, a great history to have. So that'll be on December 2nd. So look for that Zoom registration and uh, to get the link and we look forward to that. Marcy, can I, can I uh, just thank you and the Marine History Museum for allowing me to, to be with you tonight? Um, but, but also to mention that Brian Crawford helped me out too. He, uh, he's been a wonderful research uh, person on the internet and, and uh, he found the easy to overlook opening dates for the West Point Inn as well as the beginning of stage service to West Point. Work on the Bolinas Fairfax Road. Yeah, it was. Anything Mount Tam and Fairfax, Bolinas, all of that. Brian, got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good dinner. Bye bye. Thanks, Dewey. Hi, Dewey's probably muted. Thank you. That was awesome. Good show, Fred. There's Dewey. Right there in the water. <laughs> of course, he'd be oh. on the beach. <laughs> Dewey. Oh. I guess Anne's got to shut everybody down, huh? <laughs>